In 2002, neuroscientist Mike Miller conducted a routine study of human memory in which he followed the same standardized procedures that neuroscientists have used for decades. First, he got a group of subjects, and he taught them some new words. And then he put them in a scanner, and he tested their ability to recall those words while he scanned their brains. Finally, he took the individual brain scans, and he combined them into one scan that represented the average brain. And here it is, <laughs> with a little bit of doctored coloring. But in Miller's study, these are the brain areas that are responsible for memory recall on average. Okay, so, so far, no surprises. Miller's average brain looks pretty much like the average brain we expect to find in most studies of memory. But something about the average brain bothered Miller. Like most scientists, he'd used averages before because he just assumed that the average brain would tell you something about individual brains. I mean, otherwise, what would be the point in using averages? But this time, he wasn't so sure. And so he asked a question that very few neuroscientists had asked before. In his study, how close were the individual brains to the average brain? Let me show you what he found. Here's one subject's brain. Everything in blue matched the average. Everything in red did not. Here's another. And another. And notice how different these individual brains are from the average brain. Now, maybe you're thinking, I just cherry-picked three brains to make a point for an eight-minute talk. Uh, but in fact, I could have selected any brain in Miller's study because not a single one was even remotely close to average. The average represented nobody. But think about what that means. If you wanted to know something about individual brains, the average may not be useful. In fact, it may be wildly misleading. Now, it turns out that the same all-important insight that you cannot understand individuals by focusing on group averages applies to more than just brains. In every field that studies individuals, we've found the same thing. There's no such thing as an average cell. There's no such thing as an average genome. There's no such thing as average cancer. And in what may be the single most important lesson for education, there's no such thing as an average student. Now, of course, if you accept this fact, and my guess is most of you do, then it's not hard to see what the problem is. Our educational system is built on the assumption that there is an average student. Think about it. Most textbooks are designed to be age appropriate, which sounds great, but it really just means that they're designed for the average student of that age. Most standardized assessments, like the SAT or IQ tests, are explicitly designed based on a comparison to a hypothetical average student. No kidding. Most of our curricular materials prescribe not only a standardized sequence, but a standardized amount of time for learning. And we set those sequences and we fix those times based on what we know about learning on average. And look, it's no accident how we got here. Our educational system was originally designed in the industrial age by people who were absolutely obsessed with averages because averages seem to work so well in managing factories. And the truth is, their system more or less accomplished what it was originally designed to do prepare generations of students for standardized jobs in an industrial economy. But the world's changed. Our demographics have changed. The skills that we need have changed. And our economy has changed. We know this. We also know that to meet the needs of society today, education must change. If our goal is to prepare students for a diverse and changing world, if our goal is to help each student become the very best that they can possibly be, then it's no longer good enough to think about students on average and to teach students on average and to rank students against an average. Instead, we absolutely must be able to understand and treat students as individuals. Now, that's a tall order. It seems like it, right? Because it is. 
And there's a good reason why we've never done it before. Because even 20 years ago, we didn't know how. But we do now. So the reason I'm here talking to you today is that we actually have a science that is specialized in understanding individuals. And it's called, rather appropriately, the science of the individual. It's highly interdisciplinary. It's deeply rooted in the mathematics of dynamic systems. And it completely upends the way we've thought about individuals and groups. And even though it's young, this new science has already led to major breakthroughs in everything from cancer research to the study of human development to the treatment of diabetes and, of course, to our understanding of human memory. And the good news is we can use this new science to build an education system that is capable of treating students as individuals. So the question to me is, where do we start? Well, if you think about the fields I just mentioned, in each case, the breakthroughs only happened after scientists overcame a mental barrier. That is, after they recognized this one all-important fact, that you cannot understand individuals using group averages. Now, I'm not saying that simply overcoming the mental barrier of average will solve all of our problems in education. It obviously won't. But I am saying it is a necessary first step. And that it is the only way that we can build an education system that can nurture the potential of all students. That's why I think we have an incredibly important choice to make about the future of education. We can choose to double down on a 19th century view of an average student. Or we can choose to follow in the path of fields like oncology, biology, neuroscience, and shift our focus to the individual. And our choice is going to matter. Because right now, doctors can treat individual cancer. Biologists can study individual cells. And neuroscientists can understand individual brains. And we can finally teach individual students. But we can't do it on average. Thank you. Thank you.